Hello and welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to do three more reviews. Um, I've been quite enjoying do doing these three reviews in one video, um, kind of clustered together in a kind of theme, kind of sometimes. So I wanted to do some more, um, and today's theme is three queer books. Um, these are just books that I've read recently that happen to be queer in some way. Two of them I really enjoyed, one of them I didn't really enjoy at all, um, and I guess I should just begin and start reviewing them. I'm gonna go down from the one I enjoyed the most to the one I enjoyed the least. So the first book that I want to talk about is Not A Virgin by Newell Basri and translated by John M. McGlynn. This book is an Indonesian coming of age novel. Because of that, I guess it feels more like a YA novel. It's like a YA contemporary, but because I guess of its translated status, it tends to, I guess, get uh, categorized within the more like literary fiction. If you're gonna go into this book, be aware that it probably is more similar to a YA book than it is to um, an adult literary read. However, saying that, I still gave it five stars. I really enjoyed it. It was perfect for exactly what it is. Um, and it was really unexpected. This book is set just outside of Jakarta in like a s small, I guess like suburban city, I think. And it follows four characters. The main character, Ricky, is the youngest son of a Muslim family who, you know, aren't exactly the wealthiest, but they, they get by. However, because there's going to be a new arrangement um, with, I think, one of his brothers and his wife moving into the house, um, Ricky overhears his parents talking about sending him to a sort of like a boarding school slash religious house for Muslim teenagers. In defiance of that, he just takes himself to this house. And whilst there, he sort of develops his uh, new sense of self and being in the world as he sort of deals with um, coming of age in, an, in a slightly more independent way. Ricky has a roommate who becomes one of the other characters. He also makes friends with um, a guy at his school. And then the guy at his school's uh, stepbrother is also becomes the fourth character. We follow these four teenagers as they um, sort of create like a very, very touching friendship, which is a really beautiful friendship to read about. If you're looking for friendship in books, this one has it in abundance. As these guys develop their friendship, we dive into a subcultural world in Indonesia in which is very queer. Um, despite two of our characters not actually being queer, they still kind of get involved in this world and are become parts of it. They're sort of cross-dressing hairdressers, there's drag queens, there's gay teenagers and gay daddies, and there's also transgender characters. And all these characters are sort of moving in between this like very particular subcultural world, um, which is on the fringes of the society. And this poses a really interesting conflict for our main character, who is straight and cisgendered, and he is also Muslim, and how seeing his friends getting involved in this world and him also becoming involved in this world, because in order to sort of survive, he has to not necessarily rent his body out, but uh, rent his company out to, to men. And he becomes a sort of kept boy um, by, by his best friend, which all kind of sets it up for quite funny adventures at times, yet at the same time it's so emotional and very touching. I think all four of these characters experience different aspects of this community, and there are really deep moments from health scares to um, rape to the shame in identity and all of these things, and these four friends kind of work through it together in a very beautiful way. What I love most about this book is that it is almost like an ethnographic novel in that it explores a culture that is so different from my own. It genuinely feels very authentic and it explores it without judgment, even though the characters do make judgments, but the characters learn and grow from their judgments and their judgments change and everything and their ideas about the world around them also change. We get like a multifaceted view of this subculture, which really makes it feel so well-rounded, so real, and allows us to engage with it in a way that I think is gonna be very important for a lot of young readers particularly. To think that a book like this is in translation makes me so happy because I really want to see more sort of YA in translation and particularly perspectives that are so incredibly different because even though I have shared identities in the gay identities with, with some of these characters and even though there are some, some um, gay experiences that they go through that I had also gone through, the way that it's approached and dealt with and understood within the, the realm of this book is so vastly different. That makes such an important um, reminder and it kind of humbles us in the Western world of the privilege that we have. And I think it goes to show sort of what shape and design liberalism can look like once it starts involving everybody and allowing everybody's voice to be a part of it. I highly recommend this book. 
even if you don't really like YA contemporary books, um, which I don't particularly, I think the, f the perspective of this novel is enough to make many readers really enjoy and value it. So then the next book that I want to talk about is Who Killed My Father by Edward Louis, and this book was translated by Lauren Stein. Um, now this book is an essay kind of memoir um, in which Edward Louis reflects on his father's life um, and the politics that sort of dictated how his father came to be the person that he is and how in his father's old age and in his father's illness, um, his father kind, kind of finally understands how he got to be in the position that he is. And Edouard Louis also kind of comes to understand that at a similar pace. Well, Edouard Louis kind of already knew. <laughs> but it sort of develops the, the narrative in a very um, interesting and touching way. Um, I think the ultimate aim of this book is actually to answer the question, who killed my father? And I think it does that very well, which serves this book as a very strong political tool. Towards the end of the book, um, we move away from being told the narrative of a father and we are delivered some stark punches about the reality of the world that we live in and the world that the working class, and particularly male working class, um, citizens kind of are facing in France, but also I think is also reflective of a lot of Western societies, because I can certainly say the same is happening in the UK. One of the biggest reasons I picked up this book was because it's dedicated to Xavier Dolan, who's one of my favourite queer film directors and film writers and actors, I guess. Um, so that definitely compelled me to be inclined, and I'm very glad that I did actually end up reading this book. What I liked about it is the fact that it is marketed as a memoir and an essay, sort of, you know, a non-fiction, because I feel like this could have been very easily just slapped on the word fiction and for it to have kind of been marketed in the way that motherhood was marketed. Um, but actually I think it saves its integrity by, you know, acknowledging its, its role as a memoir and an essay. In terms of queerness, this kind of gives a really beautiful perspective on masculinity. Um, coming from Edouard Louis, who is gay himself and who grew up uh, quite effeminate within a house that kind of didn't really support that, um, it paints the whole tone of this essay in a way that is told, um, in a way that I particularly appreciate, because it is that softer, more feminine perspective um, yet um, embracing all the range of masculinity that there could possibly be. And I feel like whilst it's very honest and very raw, I don't feel like it's judgmental and you can really feel the tenderness between Edouard Louis and his father, um, and particularly that Louis has for his father. I gave this book four stars because the writing was easy, it was um, subtle, it wasn't too uh, indulgent, and it wasn't a reflection of, an of a heightened ego from Edouard Louis' uh, perspective, which is something I always kind of worry about. And the anger that fuels it at the end kind of really helps to deliver the, the whole meaning and the reality of the world that Edouard Louis has lived in. But it just, I don't know, there was something that was just kind of missing for me. It was very touching, but I didn't feel that emotionally invested in it. I felt like there was a barrier between me and this book, and perhaps that's what the author's intention was. Um, but that kind of just stopped me from really enjoying it and coming away from this book feeling like it was very powerful. I think it can be a powerful tool, but I don't think for me it's really succeeded in that front. However, I would still recommend it to so many people. And then the last book um, is a book that I gave two stars in the end. I, somehow I managed to finish it. And that book is Lost Boy by Sassafras Lowry. This is a Peter Pan retelling that was super queer. Um, it's like a queer punk novel, how to how to explain this piece. For me, I feel like one of its biggest problems was that it felt too much just like a sort of fan fiction that I would have read when I was 14, which is fine. I think that sort of fiction is a perfectly valid um, form of fiction. And of course, where it's, you know, working with a story that's in public domain, it can actually be published. And sometimes we do need these kinds of books to be published um, just to, you know, really tell stories from alternative perspectives and, and different queer beings and stuff. So I can feel like there would be a lot of, uh, you know, 16 year olds that would really find value in this book. For me, however, it just was written poorly, didn't make sense, um, was just kind of like satisfying the author's own personal ideals and dreams and just felt kind of really immature and infantile, which I guess you would make sense if they're dealing with Peter Pan, the story of the boy who never grows up, but it's 
being queered in a completely sort of different way in which all the characters are trans or gender fluid. It's not really, it's not exactly uh, clear sort of the gender identities of them. They use pronouns which I guess help to detail how they perceive themselves but it still isn't actually very informative <laughs> um, which I think is part of the author's actual intention. However it just made it kind of messy. So I think all the characters are trans, gender fluid, different forms of uh, feminine and masculine identities on top of them. I think, who knows, um, but it kind of looks into like the queer homeless community um, and also the the leather BDSM community and kind of, you know, portrays them to be the exact same communities, which I felt, felt was a bit odd. There's so many really weird judgments in this book. I feel like it's actually a very narrow-minded book. It kind of devalues its sense of queerness because at the end of the day, even though you're selling a queer story, you're kind of doing what you're trying to subvert by, you know, dismissing other realities. Um, well, I get, and that was, you know, a massive problem. There are things that didn't really make sense because the author was trying to keep hold of the original Peter Pan story yet and fit it into their world. Um, so like, for example, the crocodile is cocaine, I think, but there's also a character who only turns up once randomly called Gator, who delivers the cocaine or is the drug dealer or something. Um, that's weird. And then there's like the fairies or like Tinkerbell. Are they fairies or pixies? The, I believe fairies. Called like fairies and each lost boy has a fairy, but they're actually pigeons, <laughs> which also seems odd because the pigeons are very intelligent beings, I guess. And, well, I, pigeons are smart. I will appreciate that, but perhaps not smart enough to, to stop Peter Pan from joining the Leather Pirates. And then the ages of all the characters seem a little bit odd, which kind of make it make less sense. Um, because are they runaway teenagers or are they actually grown-ups that, you know, refuse to live by a grown-up lifestyle? And it, it was just a mess. It was it was all over the place. It didn't make sense. The story was so boring. When I when I finished it, I was just like, sorry, what, what was meant to have been told to me here? Because, you know, it, I think where it tried to really fit into the Peter Pan narrative, it kind of lost touch of its own sense of being, even though it's trying to vehemently push its own sense of being. It didn't really have an, a story. The ending just didn't make any sense compared to everything that came before and it was so emotionally vacant even though I feel like it was meant to be emotionally powerful. Um, and it was just very sloppy writing in my opinion. I, there are very few positive things I could say about this book. The only positive being that it offers an alternative perspective to gender identity, uh, sexual identity, um, kink identity, um, which you don't really see in literature. So I guess in that respect, there are going to be people out there who are going to find a lot of value in this book. Um, I'm not one of those people, and I can't really think of many people off the top of my head who would. Um, but you know, it has its right to exist, and it should exist. I'm glad that it does exist. <laughs> I just wish it was a little bit better. So those are my three reviews. Let me know your thoughts on these books, if you've read them, or if you have heard about them, or if you haven't heard about them, down in the comments below. Um, and I'll see you soon for another video. Bye bye.